It is ready to go. Okay, let's begin. Let's see what we have today. Today we have many more questions and before us, so we'll see how far we get. Things are kind of building up over time. So now we'll see, see what we've got here. On the SN Sangyuta Nikaya 59 discourse, uh, one, s one phrase that goes, sometimes they go from this world to the other world, and sometimes they come from the other world to this world. Uh, I recall someone asked the Buddha if there is life in other planets, and he said, yes. Uh, is there any elaboration on this in the sutta? So <laughs> What do they look like? Is that what you mean? Is that, is that, I know that, was your, that, that was your question as well. So, is there any life on other planets? And uh, this was your question as well, right? You asked before at the microphone. It was a very similar question, yeah. <laughs> but not yours here. So, the, uh, and the answer, interesting answer about life uh, on other planets is that the Buddha said that these world systems are found uh, in many, many of them, yeah, world system, remember being the uh, planet Earth, the Sun and the Moon, and then all the beings that exist in dependence on that solar system. Uh, and he says in one of the suttas, in the Anguttara Nikaya 3, I think is number 80 or something like that, uh, that there is a thousand such solar system, uh, and then there is another one, a thou even larger, a thousand to the second power such such solecism, thousand to the second power is a million, right? And then he says there is a larger, even larger number of a solar system, a thousand to the third power such solecism. That's a billion solar systems, uh, and they all have this kind of structure, yeah, with the sun, moon, the earth, and then all the beings that live in dependence on that. Uh, so there is, according to the Buddha, at least a billion solar systems out there with beings. So what do they look like? Yeah. What do those beings look like? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Do they look like aliens or do they look like, are they green or blue or what, <laughs> what, what are they like? Are they kind of look, do they look like, or, or are they maybe look like ordinary human beings? Yeah. So, and uh, I, I, I don't know, I think the answer is that if you, because of uh, we are all kind of related to each other, yeah, maybe sometimes you can get born in one solar system, another one you can get born in another solar system. <laughs> then because we can move around like that and we are tend to be attached to each other and attached to our form and the way we are, I think it's very likely that those beings will be very much like us. Uh, they won't be all that interesting, yeah? They won't be they, have, they won't have little antennas on the heads or these kind of things. They probably just look like ordinary human beings. Uh, they won't be the kind of cartoon, uh, cartoon alien that you find in the cartoons. Uh, the mov so many movies, exactly, and this is, yeah, the movies don't match with the suttas. You, usually they, they should read the suttas first before they want make the movies, so it becomes more realistic. Uh, that's what I reckon. Uh. <laughs> some, some of them do that. Some of the kind of movie makers, they are interested in Buddhism or or Hinduism or whatever, and sometimes they read about these things and they make the movies a little bit according to that. Uh, remember Star Wars, Star Wars, they have the Yoda, you remember Yoda in Star Wars? Uh, yeah? Yoda is like a Pali Sanskrit word, which means warrior. So it's a warrior kind of, you know, the, the Yoda. So it is, sometimes there is some relationship between these things. Uh, but I think they, should, they probably should read some more suttas first before they make these things. Uh. So, um, yeah, but I, d I don't think this is what is meant in this particular case. When you go from one world to another one, uh, it does not usually mean that you go from one planet to another planet. Uh, these worlds that I've talked about here are uh, worlds in terms of uh, different realms of existence. Yeah, the uh, uh, the uh, Chattaro Maharajika Devas and that sort of thing. Yeah, and that's really what it is uh, reflected to here. Uh. So uh, it is not elaborated a lot because probably because it isn't all that interesting, yeah? It is just, the Buddha just says that there are beings out there, and this idea exists in these ancient texts, and it's only recently that cosmologists uh, agree, yeah, that there are beings out there. It only happened in the last few kind of decades. Uh, you have discovered planets uh, outside of the solar system where people think maybe there are beings. Uh, and one day we probably discover that the Buddha was right. The Buddha has said it for two and a half thousand years already. Uh, so we should listen more to the Buddha, that's what I reckon. Uh, we take, we're kind of way behind the Buddha when it comes to these kind of questions. Uh, 
It's amazing. And the interesting thing is that when the Buddha talks about these things in the suttas, uh, he doesn't make a big deal out of it. He doesn't make a fuss. He, uh, this is not what is important in the suttas. Uh, the reason why he talks about cosmology and he talks about these things, uh, they are just incidental. Uh, they are incidental to the Dhamma, to the main point that he wants to bring out. And that main point usually is about impermanence or something like that. Uh, that's why he talks about these things. Uh, so for us, it's like really exciting, yeah, or oh, cosmology, is there other beings out there? For the Buddha, it's kind of completely irrelevant, yeah, of course there are beings out there, but they're just like us anyway. They're just suffering, they have the same problems as us. Occasionally a Buddha will arise in that world system, uh, big deal, yeah, okay, forget about it. Uh, get back to reality. The reality, the problem really is impermanence and suffering. That's what we need to resolve. If you go too much into philosophy and cosmology and science, you get sidetracked because it is so exciting. That's why people are interested in these things. You get sidetracked and you forget about what really matters, which is this uh, the problem that we have right in front of us. So, so some of the suttas that talk about cosmology, I have read out one of those suttas before here in KL, that is the Seven Sons Sutta. Someone mentioned that one before, and the Seven Sons Sutta is this remarkable sutta about how the sun gradually expands. It's not clear whether there's seven suns or whether there's seven stages of one sun. It's not clear what actually it means, but it, it may be interpreted to be that, regardless of what it is, the heat of the sun gets stronger and stronger, whether it's more than one sun or one seven stages. The heat of the suns gets stronger and stronger and stronger until the planet, the earth, starts to burn up. First all the plants die, yeah? the animals die, the water starts to evaporate, the great oceans go down and go down and go down until they're completely dry. And this of course is exactly what is going to happen in the future, yeah? when the sun starts to expand, it gets hotter. Then the earth starts to burn, smolder and burn, the mountains come crashing down, and the whole earth is kind of engulfed in flames. And if you look at modern cosmology and how, what they say about the sun, that is exactly what they are saying. Eventually the sun will become so large, it, in all likelihood, they're not 100% sure yet, because this is still, the science isn't 100% settled yet, but the, I think the majority view is that eventually the sun will actually encompass the earth, and the whole earth will burn up, and there will basically be nothing left. And the Buddha said this two and a half thousand years ago. Why did the Buddha say it? And again, he didn't say it because he was kind of thought this was interesting and this was philosophy and this was exciting. The Buddha was saying it in the context of impermanence. Uh, yeah, this is, everything is so impermanent. Even the earth that we rely on, the very ground under our feet, is going to eventually disappear and will be completely burnt up. That is how impermanent it is. And then the Buddha says, you may not believe me, you think I'm talking crazy stuff. Uh, only one who has seen the truth will understand that this is right. Because for the audience in ancient India, this would have sounded preposterous. What are you talking about? The earth burning up. It would have sounded completely wacky. Yeah. And uh, so the Buddha has to say, well, you know, you have to see these things, then you will understand. How does the Buddha see it? Because you wonder, how can he see these things? And I think the way that the Buddha sees this is he, ha he has recalled many past lives, he has seen the nature of the universe contracting and expanding, seen how stars have a similar kind of cycle, yeah, where they expand and they form and then they expand and eventually they disappear. And he has seen how the universe works and that's why he can talk about this kind of impermanence. So the Buddha wasn't really interested in these things. Uh, people often ask about Buddhist cosmology, but this is not what the Buddha is about. Buddha is about other things. Uh, but sometimes it touches on these things incidentally as part of a larger teaching. Uh, if you want to read about this, I actually I spoke, I gave a talk a while ago which has been turned into a little essay called, uh, what's it called? Uh, did the Buddha know the cosmos or something like that? It's available online somewhere, so you can read it. And they talk about these things in more detail. Uh, and it kind of is, uh, might be interesting for you. Uh. So this is how the Buddha sees this. Uh, and also talking about the cosmos expanding and contracting. Uh, yeah? My guess, I always bet on the Buddha. To me, the Buddha is more kind of, 
he gets things right. Yeah, the cosmologist might not get it right, but the Buddha gets it right. So eventually they will settle on the idea that the Buddha and the world, the universe expands and then it contracts again. It expands and contracts. It goes through cycles, yeah? Or at least it goes through some sort of cycle. Uh, it doesn't just, it's not one big bang, that's the end of it. Uh, there's a cyclical universe. Uh. Okay. There are more questions, we're going to move on uh, because. Uh, Okay, what is the purpose and significance of chanting? Do we need to learn the Abhidhamma? <laughs> what do you think? You think you need to learn the Abhidhamma? It's the best, isn't it? Isn't the Abhidhamma the highest? That's what they say. The Abhidhamma is the highest teaching. It is, the sup it is, the, uh, it is not the kind of preliminary teaching, it's the absolute teaching here. This is it. This is kind of the highest expression of the Buddha's teaching here. Is that right? That's what you hear sometimes, yeah, that the Abhidhamma is like the absolute and the kind of the, the teaching in the Sutta is the relative uh, teachings. Uh, and uh, because of that, the Abhidhamma is kind of uh, higher. But uh, so the question, this is a very interesting question. It is something that you, uh, I think really is still needed to be talked about in the world because still a lot of people spend a lot of time learning Abhidhamma. And, uh, the question is, is it really necessary? And one of the things that I always felt when I, because I have read a little bit of the Abhidhamma, if you read some of the Abhidhamma Tipitaka, it is um, very dry, incredibly dry stuff. It is a little bit more, comes alive a little bit more if you read things like the Abhidhamma Sangaha, the compendium of the Abhidhamma, translated also by Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, which kind of puts it together a little bit better. But when you read the Pit, Abhidhamma Pitaka, boy, it is really ultra dry. Uh, and um, so, um, is it necessary? If it is necessary, it doesn't matter if it's dry, you will still read it, yeah? But if it is necessary, then maybe we can just skip it because it is so, it is really rather boring, to be honest. Uh, so, how do we decide these things? And the way to decide these things that I always come back to, the most significant, the most important thing of Buddhism is the word of the Buddha. Yeah? The Buddha established Buddhism. The Buddha, everything we do today is based on the idea that the Buddha was awakened. If the Buddha wasn't awakened, everything else in Buddhism collapses. Everything only has meaning in so far as the Buddha existed and knew what he was talking about. Right? Without the Buddha having insight into reality, everything else kind of collapses. Uh. So what we really need to know is what did the Buddha teach? That is what is interesting here. Yeah. So if the Buddha didn't teach the Abhidhamma, who taught the Abhidhamma? This is really a very important point. Who taught it? We actually, I will, in a second I will show you that the Buddha didn't teach the Abhidhamma. It's absolutely certain that the Buddha didn't teach the Abhidhamma. We can know that through all kind of analysis of these teachings. Uh. Uh, and if that is true, what does it mean? Who did teach the Abhidhamma? And the reality is we don't know where it comes from. It obviously comes from disciples of the Buddha, but we don't know which disciples. Were they Arahants? Were they stream enters? Were they Putujanas? Were they Scallywags? We just don't know who they were. Can we trust and read something that we don't really understand where it came from? It's very dangerous, isn't it? I'm not saying the Abhidhamma is bad, but we don't really know how good it is. So why can I say that the Abhidhamma is not the word of the Buddha? How can we know that? And you can know that for a large number of reasons. You can know that because the language is very different in the Abhidhamma. The vocabulary it uses is different from the suttas. If you look at the suttas, there's like a unified kind of language. The grammar is roughly the same. The words used are the same, the kind of expressions, how it is expressed, the linguistic style is the same. You move to the Abhidhamma, it's different kind of vocabulary, different linguistic expression and all of these kind of things. You can tell that it comes from a different author. It is not the same person who spoke the suttas as the person who spoke the Abhidhamma. It's very obvious when you read it. The ideas expressed are different from the ideas in the suttas. They are developments of those ideas. They go further, they bring it further. They're not, they're not, the suttas are like, again, they have an integrity to them. They are, 
Same ideas expressed from different angles, uh, but the Abhidhamma is a further development of those ideas that would have come after. If it is a further development, it would have, co have, co have to come later. Yeah? So you can tell it on linguistic reasons, you can tell it on reasons of the theory being different. Uh, but the most important point, the one that makes it absolutely clear that the Abhidhamma is later, the one that makes it unmistakable, uh, is that you do a comparative study of what exists in all the different schools of Buddhism. And what we have in the present day, we have the Theravada school, yeah, in the Pali language. Then we have a large part of the Sarvastivadan school translated into Chinese. Then we have some in the Mula Sarvastivadan school translated into Tibetan. Actually in Chinese there also is some of the Dharmaguptaka school. There's a few different schools in Chinese available, in Chinese language. Then there are some in, Sarvastiva, so in the Sanskrit language and a few other in very rare and unusual languages. You probably wouldn't even have heard of these languages because they are kind of died out a long time ago. And uh, when you compare the suttas across these different languages, you find they are very similar, yeah, the ones that exist in Chinese translation. You can read them and you compare them to Pali and you know exactly this is that sutta and they match up. There are some differences and that's very interesting because that you have to need, a, you need to explain the differences. But very, very high degree of similarity. And that is one, one of the things that can be reassure us that this is the word of the Buddha because the Sarvastivadan school and the Theravada school have existed separately for about 2,300 years. So this separation into separate texts happened 2,300 years ago and still there is a remarkable similarity between these schools. That's astonishing, isn't it? 2,300 years apart, you would think it would be corrupted, but it isn't. Uh, and that shows you how conservative the traditions have been uh, and how careful they have been at keeping these scriptures correct and intact over such long periods of time. Uh, that's the suttas. That's why we think they are authentic, because they have that integrity to them. Come to the Abhidhamma. We have Abhidhamma of three different schools. Uh, Theravada is a complete Abhidhamma. You have Abhidhamma in Chinese translation, the Sarvastivadan Abhidhamma. And then you have partly the, sorry, the Dharmaguptaka Abhidhamma as well, also in Chinese translation. Uh, and now if you compare them, there is a small core that is common to those three Abhidhammas, uh, that is similar, and that is very closely related to what is called the Vibhanga of the Pali Abhidhamma uh, Pitaka, which is the most ancient part of the Pali Tipitaka, of, of the Abhidhamma Pitaka, very, very similar to the suttas. It's not a very developed form of Abhidhamma. That core is kind of in common or similar in those three schools. Uh, but in other aspects, they diverge enormously. Uh, and from that, the fact that they diverge, you know that they don't have a common core, they don't come from a common source. They were developed independently in the different schools, that's why they're different, yeah? That's how you explain the difference. So each school had a different Abhidhamma, that could only have happened after the schools came into existence, otherwise they wouldn't have a different Abhidhamma. So this would have been 200, 300 years after the Buddha that this Abhidhamma came into existence. That's why it is different. Otherwise, it would have been the same if it came, it was rooted in the time of the Buddha. So there is no doubt that this is not the word of the Buddha. We know that, yeah, with almost absolute certainty. And uh, the reason why, sometimes you will hear monks saying that the Abhidhamma is the word of the Buddha, and the reason why they say that is because they are not really aware of some of these modern studies, of comparative studies. Traditionally, especially Burma is the very stronghold of Abhidhamma in the world. Burmese monks are famous for Abhidhamma monks, Abhidhamma scholars. Uh, but they don't really know about this sort of scholarship. Yeah? They just accept the Burmese tradition that the Abhidhamma is the highest expression of the Buddhist teachings. They accept that without questioning really, because that is part of the, of the Burmese tradition. But once they get exposed to these ideas, it's only a matter of time be before they will have to change their minds. Yeah? And they will have to realize actually that wasn't correct what they were believing in. Uh, so it's still, it takes a while for these ideas to spread out because these are fairly modern ideas uh, and you need a very broad kind of 
not understanding of Buddhism. I've, I've been exposed to some of those great scholars around the world who studied all of these traditions, uh, and that's why I, I have more knowledge of these things. Uh, you don't get that knowledge as easily in a traditional Buddhist country because you have fo learn everything in Burmese, you learn everything in whatever language, you don't have that broader exposure. Sometimes you do, but not always. Uh, so that's why they tend to be more conservative. But down the track, uh, I'm sure that they also will come around because it is basically, it is just uh, the way, it's just the reality of things. Uh. So do you need to learn Abhidhamma? I would really discourage you from learning the Abhidhamma. It is not needed. Uh. It is hard enough already to read all the suttas. Yeah, it's already have that many suttas. It's enough to read, enough for a lifetime in there. And instead of being sidetracked by something which is not the word of the Buddha, which may even be wrong, we don't know, it may be something wrong in there, instead of being sidetracked by that, come back to the word of the Buddha. There's plenty enough there to do. And the word of the Buddha is so much more alive, so much more interesting, so much less dry. The Abhidhamma actually is incredibly boring. You really have to have a very good reason to read it. And really, there is no good reason to read it. That's my opinion. So, there you are. I, okay, let's come back to the first question. Uh, what is the purpose and significance of chanting? So, the original purpose of chanting is to remember the suttas, remember that these things were oral, orally spoken uh, suttas. Uh, yeah? So, these were part of uh, the Indian culture, was an oral culture, there weren't any texts at that time, uh, and the way it was passed on was through reciting Chanting is just a way of reciting the texts. So, uh, for that reason, um, uh, we still do some chanting today, and that chanting that we do today is similar kind of thing. It's really just a reciting of Buddhist texts. So, what is the purpose of that? Well, the purpose really, originally, was to keep the text so they didn't, when they didn't get lost. The second one was to learn the text. You chant them so you learn the content, you understand what is going on. Yeah? This is the main reason why we chant. That is the main purpose. So ideally, we should chant in English, or you should understand the Pali. Most people don't understand Pali. It's quite rare these days. So, but that is really the idea. So if you do chant the Metta Sutta, for example, read a good translation in English as well, so you know what is going on. Karaniya Mata Kusa Lena <laughs> yeah. So this is what should be done by one who is skillful and these kind of things. Yeah. So understand the meaning. It's beautiful meaning. And when you know the meaning, it actually sometimes brings up some of the feelings that you're supposed to experience with metta. This is the beautiful thing of it. Uh, so this is really the purpose. There can be more purposes for chanting. Another purpose is that you work really hard, yeah, you maybe you get stressed out because of all the things that you have to do, and then you come ho home in the evening and you need something to relax to, you can put on some chanting and just listen to the chanting, just to calm you down. Does it, does it, does it calm you down? Well, if it does calm you down and it's nice, you can put on. If it doesn't calm you down, put on some other music, yeah. Yeah, d don't, just don't put on some kind of really, kind of, you know, heavy metal or anything like that, because that will kind of excite you even more, there's too much, too much going on. Uh, put on something calming and soothing, that's the idea. So that's the other reason for chanting, just to kind of relax. Many people in Buddhist countries, they are, have listened to chanting since they were children, and they kind of, they, because of that, then when they hear it, they feel at ease and relaxed, and it feels nice. Uh, that's another good reason for using it. Uh. So that is really what it, uh, sort of what it is about. Okay. <coughs> Next question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, short life is not necessarily all due to kama, but other related conditions as a human being. Uh, is there anywhere in the suit as, as, as to how much our life is due to kama? And if current good deeds or merits can change our course of life, does an unexpected death, say from a fall while taking a selfie, <laughs> be due to current environment conditions and not comic? Yes, I would say so. Yeah, if you 
if you take a fall because you're taking a selfie, you're kind of standing on the mountaintop and you fall off the mountaintop, then uh, it's because you are silly. That's, <laughs> that's, why, that's why you die. <laughs> you are not wise. So this is the, this is the problem. So, so, um, so the answer is, and this is one of the things the Buddha says, one of the, you know, there's all these factors that um, make you suffer or give problems in life that leads to bad feelings, and one of them is being careless. Yeah, so standing on the mountaintop and kind of taking a selfie, that's kind of being careless. That's why you die, yeah? Not because of bad karma, but because you are silly. You should always need to be careful. People say, often say that they're going to test their karma to see how good the karma is. Uh, but you are being very stupid if you test your karma, because usually you just end up going wrong. Uh, I don't know if you've heard those stories in Thailand. There was a story, I don't know if these stories are true, but uh, the story of the famous general who had kind of got an amulet, yeah? And these amulets are supposed to protect your life. Uh, yeah, very, very powerful amulet. And they pay enormous amounts of money, apparently, for these amulets, like tens of thousands of dollars or whatever. I don't know what it is. Uh, enormous amounts. Uh, and uh, I was once given a Buddha statue when I went to, once you, I give, sometimes you give these special blessed Buddha statues by some powerful monk, and they give it to you, and I was told this is probably worth tens of thousands of dollars on the market in Thailand, yeah? I thought, cheap. Is <laughs> so you have these things as a monk, which are really, really valuable, it's very strange. But I'm not, I don't intend to sell it, of course, but um, <laughs> it's still a weird kind of feeling here. Yeah. So, according to this story, this general said, well, I've got this medallion now, I cannot die. Yeah, I am protected from all kind of bad things. Uh, because it says in the suttas, yeah, if you have a good, met if you have a lot of metta, for example, you can be pr protected against weapons even. Uh, and this medallion is supposed to be kind of equivalent to that metta. It protects you against weapons. Uh, so this general said, well, okay, I, I cannot die, so here is my gun, shoot me, I want to prove that I can't die here. So this underling shot him, and he died, because he was stupid, yeah? That is why he died, because he was just really, he, <laughs> he doesn't know what he's doing. And this is, kind of shows you that uh, you have to use your wisdom, you have to be smart in life, you can't just kind of go with these kind of things, uh, because uh, this, is <laughs> this is how you, so these are the, there's many things that lead to death and lead to problems. Another thing the Buddha said is not due to kamma is illness. Illness is due to some imbalance in the body according to the ancient Indian medical system. The bile, the phlegm and uh, wind or something like that. Three things and these things if they get into imbalance then you get ill. It's got nothing to do with kamma says the Buddha. But of course illness if it is very bad can lead to death. Yeah. So illness can lead to death. That is one reason right there why you can die and not actually have anything to do with karma. Then there is assault, is one of those reasons. So someone assaults you on the street. Again, the Buddha says nothing to do with karma. Yeah, you just get assaulted because that is, you went to the wrong place at the wrong time. Do you get assaulted here in KL? You go, yeah, so certain places are worse than others, right? Don't go to those places at the wrong time. If you do it, you're asking for trouble. Don't test your karma to see how good your karma is. Uh, if you are careless, uh, yeah, if the weather is, the weather is another one. Uh, when the weather gets really bad, people die. We see this recently in the floods around the world, people dying in the floods or dying from the heat waves or whatever it is. Uh, it's like the weather, bad weather being increased by climate change, yeah, in Australia with all the fires and all of that. Uh, so a lot of these things don't have anything to do with karma. So, how much is due to karma and how much is just due to being born as a human being? And you cannot really know. And I would say it doesn't really matter. Yeah, it's kind of irrelevant. It doesn't matter what the causes are. What we need to do instead is to learn from the suffering in our life that this is just nature. If you think that there is a cause, you may think that there is a solution in the realm of controlling your karma. But that is not where the solution lies, because regardless of how much you try to control your karma, you're still going to suffer, because that is part and parcel of the human existence. And because you're going to suffer regardless, the solution actually lies in the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path to overcome these problems. 
That is the solution, not to mess around in the realm of karma, trying to get a better life by simply living well and then getting, making merit for the future. Uh, so uh, you, I, I don't think you can know where it, what it comes from. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, you don't worry so much about that. Uh, but can good karma change the course of your life? Yes, it can. Uh, but the main reason why the kamma can change the course of your life is not that you get more material well-being, yeah, or even you, maybe you can get more healthy, it may affect your body, and the very often the reason why you cannot get more material well-being is because very often we are stuck in a certain life, we are born into a certain family, we already have a certain education and job, so we are kind of in a rut if you like, we're already on a certain track and Kamma cannot really lift you off that track. The time you get lifted off the track is when you get reborn in your next life, that is when you move on to a different track. That's why Kamma usually takes effect from one life to another one, because in this life you're kind of stuck already in a certain type of existence. Yeah, so that is why really Kamma is about next life. The Kamma in this life that's why I talked about the mental kamma. You experience kamma as a mental happiness, mental energy. That is the best way to experience kamma in this life. Because when you experience it like that, then it actually is very supportive of your spiritual practice. Of course, it makes you happier as a person as well. It's not just a spiritual thing. It is also a worldly thing, because it makes you generally more happy. It makes you more popular. You want to be popular? Yeah? <laughs> the way to be popular is often to have more metta and more kindness, more generosity, treat people well, and then you become more popular. So it leads to all good things really, yeah, if you make merit and, uh, and these kind of things. So please don't think that making merit, you shouldn't do it, you should absolutely do it. You should make good karma, but you should do it for a slightly different reason than most people do it. You should do it to support the spiritual practice in the broader sense. And it will have other effects as well, but that's kind of uh, secondary, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, if you are not happy with my replies, you are welcome to, you know, to say something if you want. If you think that uh, you know what I'm saying is not good enough or not, uh, haven't really addressed your question or whatever, uh, please feel free to to say so. Uh, it's okay. You don't have to. You don't, you don't have to just sit there and kind of, um, if you think that what I'm saying doesn't work, then please let me know. It's perfectly okay. Okay, next one here. Ajahn Ramali, can you please explain again how the five aggregates links to rebirth? How the five aggregates link to rebirth? So, uh, the, um, the five, it is the thing that creates Rebirth is always craving, yeah? Because craving is always about the future, craving is about kind of projecting your mind and your person into a new life, because if you think about craving, it's always about the state you want to be. You're not happy with the way things are now, so because of that you are thinking about the future state. So you're always kind of heading to that future already, thinking about how you're going to exist, uh, what you're going to be in that future state. And that is a craving kind of projects you already now into the future. And the same thing it does when you die, yeah? You're already moving on to that idea that you're where you want to go. Uh. And the idea is that when you are reborn, yeah, it is always the five aggregates that are reborn. It is always the same thing, yeah? yeah? The five Aggregates are the thing that you have in this life, uh, but there isn't any life apart from the five aggregates. All life is really the five aggregates. Uh, so as long as there is rebirth, it is the five aggregates that you continue on the other side. Uh, I'm going to talk more about dependent origination on the very last part of this retreat. And dependent origination is this beautiful formulation that shows you how the aggregates are kind of constructed from one life and then they re-arise in the future life. And it shows you what kind of aggregates you get in the future life. Yeah, so what kind of aggregates you have, whether they are happy aggregates or miserable aggregates. So most people want happy aggregates, yeah? So to get happy aggregates you have to live in a certain way. And then the happy aggregates arise as a consequence. So 
if you live well, if you live with kindness, if you treat other people well, happy aggregates in your next life. Uh, it's a good deal, isn't it? Uh, yeah? All you have to do is to live well. And living well is a good idea anyway, because if you live well, you will be happy here and now, and you get these good aggregates in your future life. Uh, is that the question you're asking? Uh, you happy with that answer? Uh, no, no, yeah, not maybe. Uh, okay, happy enough. You're not at least you're not complaining. So it must be must be good enough. Uh, okay. <coughs> Dear Ajahn, during this morning's talk, you suggested having identity with uh, the positive qualities of kindness. Is that uh, can you suggest or give an example of how to do it? Uh, uh, will having wrong view or following wrong practices create barriers to our spiritual progress which last even to future lives with metta? Um, okay, so uh, identity. How do you identify with, with that? And uh, the, the way you do that is basically that when you act with kindness, yeah? you take that to be who you are as a person. The more you act with kindness, the more you kind of think of yourself as that kind of person. Because the two things go together. If you treat other people kindly, you tend to think, yeah, I treat other people kindly. You start to identify with those acts. It's just almost automatic if you do that consistently. And especially if you enjoy being kind. This is kind of the critical thing. Enjoy kindness. If you enjoy kindness, it's so easy to be kind. That's why I say, see the connection between your intention and how you feel about it. If you can see that connection, that I am intending well and therefore I'm feeling well, wow, it becomes so powerful, you want to do it more. You feel good about it, because you feel good about it, you identify it. We identify almost naturally with anything that we feel good about. The reason you identify, you have the identity you have, is because, in large part, because you feel good about that. At least the part of your identity that you feel proud of. The rest of it you kind of forget about it, but the part that you're happy with, that's, where, that, that's what you think about and you talk about. So it happens almost automatically. You think of yourself, yeah, I'm keeping the five precepts. Yeah, yes, I try to care for others. I try to be generous. And when you think about that, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, just by reflecting on that and feeling it as wholesome, you automatically start to identify with it. Uh, and you feel that, that is who you are as a person. Uh, so just do it, uh, live it, uh, and then the identity coming out of that almost comes as a consequence. Uh, and think about it in a positive way, as a positive quality, as something that you like to be. This is the kind of person I want to be. And then the identity kind of follows along. Uh, so you're steering yourself a little bit, yeah? And you realize the limitations of other identities. Uh, you realize how limited it is to limit yourself to one kind of person and then kind of block, blocking everyone else out uh, and why that is problematic uh, and how you create kind of narrowness and confinement in your own mind uh, by blocking certain people out of your mind. Yeah? It creates us and them, it creates problems, gives rise to all of these things. Once you understand that, uh, you also move away from that kind of identity uh, at the same time. So, uh, yeah, if you have wrong views and following wrong practices, it can create barriers to our spiritual practice which lasts even to future lives. Yes, it can do. And uh, especially wrong views are very sticky. They often sit very deeply because, again, we identify with them to some extent. This is who I am. I am a Christian. This is my religion. I believe in the Creator God. And because you believe in that, uh, very often it becomes a very strong view yeah, that this is what it is. Uh, and sometimes we have been conditioned to have these views in the past. Uh, people may have had that view in many past lives. They come into this life and then they can't really let go of it because it is there. Uh, so these things tend to be very sticky. So absolutely that they can uh, be an obstacle also in future life. And with those wrong views very often come the wrong practices as well, yeah, as a consequence of that. Uh, so uh, this is why it is again good to read the suttas, to try to understand this Buddhist idea of right view. Uh, yeah? And as you do that, you will 
uh, that will tend that positive right view will also tend to carry on in the future in future lives so, so is that another question on the other side there seems to be questions on both sides is that uh, okay then anyway so, so this is uh, yeah, this seems to be, presumably, is another question. Two different people. Um, that's very interesting. Okay, dear Rajan, thank you for the enlightening talk with this awakening of ignorance and trap, so-called. Why do we now still allow the trap to be here? What immediate action that uh, we can act now to get away from this trap uh, uh, takes how takes how long? <laughs> okay. Uh, um so the the, the <laughs> so the, the reason why you don't you, you allow the trap to be is that you don't even know it is there yeah you don't really you don't really even know precisely what the trap is but the trap basically is your personality that's the trap yeah why is that a trap? Because your personality is a habit. It's a habit that you have built up in the past, it's a habit that you are attached to, to some extent. This because your personality is just a particular way that the five khandas appear. And of course we are attached to those five khandas if they are our personality. So you're, you're just attached to your personality. That is the trap. Yeah. So that trap, that personality includes some bad habits and some good habits. So be very careful, because those bad habits, because that is part of this trap, uh, it is now is your opportunity to get out of those bad habits. That is really what you should focus on. Uh, but you will find it can be quite hard to get ba out of bad habits. Uh, and in part that is precisely because it is part of who we take ourselves to be. Yeah? And because you take yourself to be those particular habits, uh, actually it's quite hard to, to let go of them. Uh, but it's very important to be very honest with yourself. What are my weaknesses? What are the things that I, where I fall short on the Buddhist path? Not to try to kind of hide yourself from yourself. We are very good at hiding ourselves from ourselves sometimes. So be honest with yourself. What is my problem? And when you understand your problem and how it is counter to the Buddhist path, then you try to move away from those habits. And you try gradually to become a different kind of person. So the trap is really our personality, and that's why it is so hard to overcome it. But then you gradually transform your personality. What does that mean? It is not really frightening. It may sound that it's frightening that you're transforming your personality, but not really, because every day our personality changes a little bit. Yeah, You're happy in the morning, maybe grumpy in the evening. I don't know what kind of person you are. Maybe some morning people or some evening people, depending on how it goes. So what we are doing is that our we are increasing the amount of time we are our better self and reducing the time we are our less good self. Yeah, In this way you are transforming yourself. And then new versions of yourself, even better versions of yourself, start to appear. And you think, wow, that's really cool, that's an even better version of me. Okay, so you go with that and you develop that. Yeah, And then you're expanding the good parts of who you are as a person, gradually, gradually, gradually. Yeah? In this way you are transforming yourself uh, in, 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 uh, by abandoning some of your old habits in this way. Uh. Most important bad habits to let go of is just uh, upset and anger. This is the biggest hindrance uh, in, uh, on the path, uh, the biggest problem that we have. Uh, and uh, so that is uh, what you should let go of. So that is, the, that is the really the trap, yeah? the personality we have built up over many, many lifetimes uh, and that we are continuing to act out. Uh, again and again and again. What immediate actions can we take? You, all you have to do is practice the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, that's what I'm talking about now. Look at your weaknesses, make sure you are clear about them, and then practice to get overcome them. How long does it take? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, it depends how committed you are. Yeah, it depends how hard you work at it, it depends on how many of these retreats you come to. Uh, this <laughs> and these kind of things. Uh, so it really depends on your commitment to the path uh, and your perseverance in the practice. Uh. Some people can overcome the habits uh, quite quickly, maybe in one lifetime if you're really fast. Uh, some people have to carry on in future lifetimes. So.
Okay, so next one. When one goes forth, is it contradictory to give up one's house, as shelter is one of the four requisites? When one goes forth, shouldn't he at least have his hospital hospitalization insurance um, covered. The purpose is not to trouble others when he gets seriously ill. I think it is also aligned with Buddhist teachings as medicine is one of the four requisites. In the monastics without uh, in insurance who would take care of a monk when he gets a serious illness? Yes, in that who, who would take care of a monk when he gets serious illness? Okay. Um, does it make sense to keep your house? Well, not really, yeah? And uh, the reason is because the house is not really the kind of suitable place for a monk to stay, usually. <laughs> if you ha usually a house is in the city, a house is in a suburb. Ideally, if you are a monk or none, you want to kind of go and live in the forest. Uh, yeah, somewhere, at least somewhere a bit away from ordinary civilization. Uh, this is kind of the ideal thing. Uh, remember that, you read the suit as one of the things you see uh, everywhere is the idea of getting away from civilization. Uh, so if you live in a house in the city, it's not ideal. Uh, there are monastics who do that, uh, but uh, it's not really recommended. Uh, and usually, if you are a monastic who lives like that, uh, very often it means that you are living the monastic life in a slightly different way, more service-oriented, uh, more about teaching and helping and caring and these kind of things, and not so oriented towards meditation practice and sila and these kind of things. Yeah, There's a slightly different way of living the monastic life, but if you really want to try to live the monastic life as the Buddha recommended, then really you should actually sell your house. Yeah, That's the best thing. To, or give it away. Give it to your family members or whatever you, yeah, whatever you do. But not hold on to it. It's not really ideal. Of course, initially you can hold on to it. This is what we normally recommend is if you start out as a monastic life, you never know how long you might end up as a monastic. You might ha give it up very quickly again. And then it's good to have a house to come back to, yeah? Otherwise you, you will suffer if you have nowhere to go. So if you, most people are a bit unsure when they become monastics, and that's fair enough. So keep your house for a while, keep some money for a while, and then when you feel sure about things, then you give it away. Or give it to someone you trust, like your family or something, and then they hold on to it for you for a while, and then see how you go. But. Uh, don't hold on to it for a place of living in, because that's not really uh, appropriate. Uh, um, hospitalization insurance covered. Yeah, you can have that covered if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, um, but um, again, if you want to keep on covering that insurance over the long term, then uh, you have to have some kind of deal with your family members or someone who keeps money for you to keep on paying for that. Because you will no longer be able to pay it yourself. It is no longer your money. You have to give up your money when you ordain. So you can't really keep on using money. I mean, if you, if you want to live properly as a monastic, that is. Yeah? If you want to live the monastic life well, you have to give up your money. Yeah? So this is one of the fundamental rules of a monastic, is that you give up your money. Not all monastics do that, uh, and, uh, but I wouldn't recommend you, if you want to become a monk or a nun, really, you should do it properly, do it all the way, do it as the Buddha intended, uh, otherwise it kind of loses its purpose. Uh, yeah? So, uh, sure, you can have hospital, hospital insurance if you want, but if you want to keep that insurance going, then get someone else to give the money to someone else and say, well, if you don't mind, maybe you can pay it in the future. And if they say yes, okay, then there's no problem. If they say no, well, maybe you have to forego the insurance. You cannot be certain when, when other people are in charge. In a mon if a monastic does not have insurance, uh, uh, who takes care of a monk when he is seriously ill? And usually the way it works is that uh, uh, the monastery sometimes has supporters and funds. Yeah, Like for example in Perth we have a Buddhist society that looks after the monastery and they receive funds on behalf of the monastic Sangha. And because they receive uh, monks money on behalf of the Sangha, it means that funds are available in case of illness. So if you really have to go to hospital, it will be covered by the monastery here. 
Yeah, there's a fund there paid by the Buddha society. So uh, it is not really a problem. Uh, yeah, and even in poorer, if you live in a poorer country, like um, you know, some of the poor Buddhist countries in the world, usually it is not a problem to get sufficient support uh, to be able to cover medical expenses. Uh, and often the lay Buddhists are very happy to support you if you get really ill. Yeah, they don't have a prob usually a problem with that. Uh, so usually it works out quite quite well in my experience. Uh, Okay, I'm not really sure why you're asking whether you, whether you are what what the, what <laughs> there's some hidden agenda there or not. But uh, anyway, <laughs> okay. Next question, number one. Whoa, many questions. Okay, number one. What determines the gender of rebirth in the human realm? So it is not bad karma. Yeah, I, I, sometimes traditional Buddhism, if you have bad karma, you get reborn as a woman. But actually, <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing like that in the sutta. The suttas don't say that. I mean, what's, it's not the difference between being a woman and a man. It's not that great anyway. How can one be bad karma and one be good karma? It doesn't make much sense. Okay, maybe it is a little bit more difficult to be a woman in this world. Yeah, it's not quite as easy because our society tends to be kind of a bit more less kind of supportive of women, probably it's probably fair to say that, a bit more discriminative against women, but the difference is fairly small, it's not a massive difference. It's not like the difference between a human being and a kangaroo, that's a big massive difference. Uh, men and women are roughly the same, yeah, we roughly enjoy the same things in life, we roughly have the same rights and, and, uh, and the obligations and all of this. Uh, so it's not bad karma that makes you a woman. The main thing that makes you a man or a woman is that you are attached to your particular gender. Uh, you are used to being a woman. You think, well, it's good to be a woman, so I will get be re reborn as a woman in the future. Uh, or you think it's good to be a man, so you get reborn as a man. Uh, that's the main thing that determines these things. Uh, could be other things as well. There might be some karma things in there, perhaps, under certain circumstances. I don't know. Uh, but that is the main thing that determines your gender. You have an attachment and then you move in that same direction in the future. It's like, who do we get reborn with? Yeah, and very often we get reborn with roughly the same people around us, a similar kind of family, because we have attachment to certain people. When you die, your mind moves in that direction because of that attachment and craving. And then bang, you get reborn with those people also in the future. Yeah, that's how this kind of rebirth happens. Uh, craving and attachment, all of these things drive this process of rebirth. Uh, number two, how do we know which part of the suttas was the original word of the Buddha and which part was subsequently added on? For instance, the Buddha always emphasized that the future is uncertain uh, and it is all in our hands right now based on what we do. However, then why did the Buddha predict the next Buddha? Uh, it feels very contradictory and confusing. Yeah. Yes, this is a good point. Uh, and um, the, uh, so what, first of all, what is the word of the Buddha? And uh, the way to know that is again to do the kind of study I was talking about before. You look at the language of the suttas, you look at what is in common across the different traditions, you look at what fits together uh, as a kind of as a whole, what is kind of um, feels like the same, yeah, it kind of looks like the same, it fits in with the other suttas. This is actually one of the criteria the Buddha himself said we should use when we collect his teachings. Does it fit a particular sutta? Does it fit with the other ones? Then you accept it, otherwise you may have to reject it. So, and what you basically come down to when you do that, if you do that thoroughly, what you come down to is what is called the four Nikayas. Nikayas is the long discourse of the Buddha, the middle length discourse of the Buddha, the connected discourse of the Buddha, and the numerical discourses of the Buddha. Four Nikayas, that is basically what, where you find the word of the Buddha. Not every sutta in that will be equally authentic, but generally speaking, you will be on the right track if you go to those four Nikayas. Yeah, so that's where you look. So read those first of all. That's already about 5,000 pages or something. It will keep you occupied for a while. And then, <laughs> and then learn Pali, right? So you can read it in Pali. Yeah? 
Is that right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, if you <laughs> especially if you become a monastic, yeah, then you can learn a bit of Pali, and then you can read it in Pali. That's even better. Yeah. Actually, doesn't you can it is there, so you can read in English, no problem. But uh, if you really want to know them, Pali even preferable. Yeah. So uh, that is where you find basically the word of the Buddha. There's a little bit more than that. For example, there are things like the Sutta Nipata which is a book mostly of verse, and the last two chapters there, called the Atakavaga and the Parayanavaga. Atakavaga means a chapter of Vates. Parayanavaga means a chapter of crossing over. These are ancient chapters uh, that are referred to other places in the suttas. And they're also found in Chinese translation and other places, so we know they're very ancient. Uh, very interesting little verses. Maybe one year we can do these verses here as part of this course, because it's quite nice to uh, do something slightly different. I tend to do the same suttas, or similar suttas, anyway, except for the Aganya Sutta. <laughs> similar kind of suttas, because I think some of the basic suttas are so important, and I think that is preferable to doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, but these suttas are also quite interesting. Yeah. Then there is things like the Dhammapada, the Udana, the Itavuttaka, the Theragatha, the Theragatha. And all of these have some authentic, some inauthentic sayings of the Buddha. You have to be a bit more circumspect with those things. Yeah. Yes? Kudaka, Kudaka Nikaya. So uh, we have the four main Nikayas, and then there is the Kudaka Nikaya. So this comes as an addition to the first four, yeah? So I'm just adding things a little bit. Uh, Uh, of the Kudaka Nikaya, you mean? Yeah. The number of books, yeah. One says 15, one says 18, actually. Yeah. yeah. But uh, a, lo a lot of the Kudaka Nikaya is not the word of the Buddha anyway. Most of it is not. Uh, yeah. It's only a small part of it which might be original. And these are the books. Uh, that's what I'm just talking about now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sutanipata, some of the Dhammapada, some of the Udana. The verses are older than the prose. The prose and Udana is not very reliable. There's been some interesting studies on that. Uh, Itivuttaka, part of that might be old. Uh, some of the Theragata, Theragata, uh, also maybe an very ancient. Uh, so, you, you know, a bit more circumspect, but uh, that too. And then there's the Vinayapitaka. Some of the Vinayapitaka is also ancient, yeah, like the Patimoka rules of the monastics is very, very ancient. Uh, uh, some of the Sangha Kamas, the, the actions of the Sangha, when you make decisions in the Sangha, also ancient, like the uh, ordination ceremony, Uposita ceremony, these kind of things are also ancient. Uh, so that is roughly, gives you a rough idea. But basically you can here trust the research done by others to be fairly accurate. This is, this is what I go by. And uh, if you want to read a little booklet, there's a book, little booklet called The Authenticity of the Early Buddhist Text. Yeah. I, I have to confess, I, w I wrote that myself together with Ajahn Sujato. We wrote this booklet. It's available online. It was published by the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies. Yeah, so it's quite, uh, it was published by a fairly high. So it has been kind of uh, properly, properly reviewed by scholars and things like that. So read that one, and that kind of gives you a good idea of what these things are. What is authentic? Authenticity of the early Buddhist texts. Authent the authenticity of the early Buddhist text. Uh, and you can type in the name Brahmali and Sujato, and then you guaranteed you will hit it online, bang, straight away, <laughs> you will have it. Uh. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he always emphasized the future is uncertain, it's all in our hands right now, exactly based on how we do. However, why did he predict the next Buddha? It's a very good question. So are you sure that he predicted the next Buddha? Well, this is right, this is the one million dollar question. Did he really predict the next Buddha? And if you start, if you read the suttas, the next Buddha is only predicted in one place, yeah? And that is in the, uh, in the, um, oh, my mind is getting a bit blurry now. <laughs> too much, too much talking here. The Dhammachaka Sihanada, so that's what it's called. Uh, Something like that. Uh, this, I think it is in uh, Majim Diga Nikaya 26. Yeah, 26 out of the Diga Nikaya. And, um, and uh, there the Buddha says in the Sutta that there will be a Buddha in the future called Metteya Buddha, Maitreya Buddha in Sanskrit, uh, who will arise at the future thing. Did the Buddha really 
say that? Or is it maybe something has been added? If it only occurs once in the whole suttas, it's a bit dodgy. Remember, one of the criteria for deciding whether something is authentic is that if it occurs many, many times. Anything which occurs only once, you have grounds for being a bit doubtful. How come he only talked about it once? Yeah, if it is important, shouldn't he talk about it in many places? If it's only one place. So this already makes you a little bit suspicious. Yeah, And the framework of that sutta is very mythological, legendary. It's not really an ordinary teaching. It's a bit like the Aganya Sutta, we just looked at before. It's more like an allegory or a story than actually a straight teaching. And a similar kind of thing in this other Dhammachaka Siyanada Sutta, whatever it is uh, called. So how do we take that further? And the way you take it further is you use comparative study to look at other versions of the same suttas. And there exists one sutta in Chinese translation, which is another version of the, the same sutta. And if you compare those two suttas, the prediction that Maitreya will arise in the future is not there in that Chinese version. Uh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. So what that means, it is quite possible, I would say quite likely, that this was somehow added later on. If that had been there from the beginning, why is it missing in the Chinese? Yeah, They wouldn't take it out. They can't, can't ta just take things out. So much more likely that it was added later on to the Pali. Maybe it was in the commentary. And because it was in the commentary, yeah, then it was added maybe by mistake during oral transmission, because they often they would recite commentary together with the suttas, and when sometimes it got mixed up, they couldn't really distinguish commentary from sutta, and commentarial material in this way would be incorporated into the sutta, and that's how sometimes you got expansions of the suttas, uh, and material which shouldn't be there actually gets incorporated. And it can, this has been shown by scholars. Uh, one of the main scholars who has studied this, uh, Venerable Analayo, he has shown that this is exactly what happens. Commentarial material being incorporated in the suttas due to failures, mistakes, and oral transmission in ancient India, happening maybe three or four hundred years after the Buddha passed away. Uh, so I think there is no prediction of a future Buddha. Yeah? I think that is the bottom line. I think this never really happened. Uh, and actually it is just a later thing that grew up and happened after the Buddha passed away. Because after the Buddha passed away, you can imagine the grief in the Buddhist community. Uh, there would be like a vacuum there, a hole, an emptiness, something missing at the very core of the Buddhist community. The Buddha that was so important, suddenly gone. And because of that, they would start to ask questions like, oh, who was this Buddha? Yeah? What, was, what was he like? Where did he come from? And then they will start to remember things in the past and sometimes add maybe a little bit too much and speculate about the Buddhas kind of carrying on for many eons and practicing. And the Bodhisattva idea would come up. The idea of, uh, the idea of many Buddhas already exists in the suttas, many Buddhas in the past. Uh, because a Buddha is just a natural phenomenon. So we know that there will be Buddhas in the future. What we don't know is that there will be a specific Buddha called Maitreya Buddha that will arise at a particular point. But yes, there will definitely be future Buddhas because um, this is just nature that Buddhas arise every now and again. Huh? So, but this whole idea of the Bodhisattva idea, this idea of future Buddhas and all of that, all of that became strong after the Buddha passed away because I started to speculate about these things. Uh, and there is a nice uh, book by the same Venerable Analayo called The Origin of the Bodhisattva Ideal or something like that. Is the origin or the genesis of the Bodhisattva Ideal or something like that. And uh, if you look that up on the internet, then you will find that book. It's a very ni nice little book to read. And it will give a lot of details on the things I've just been talking about now. And how the idea of Maitreya Buddha arose later on is not really part of the early Buddhist tradition. Here. Okay, we're still on the same person. The third question. Uh, assuming a person has enough good merits and deserves to be reborn in the heavenly realm. However, he or she chooses to be reborn in the human realm again by cultivating the inclination to come back to the human realm because he or she finds that there is much su more sukha than dukkha in heavenly realm and that may cause one to be heedless and affect the practice. Please share your thoughts. The Buddha 
never says that we should incline our mind to be reborn in any specific realm. He doesn't say that this is a good idea anywhere. This is a much later idea, the idea that we should try to incline our mind to try to be reborn in a particular place. It may not work. If this was really something we should do, then the Buddha would presumably have said so. So the Buddha just says, well, you just allow your kamma to take its course. And if you have made good kamma, you get reborn accordingly. If we try to steer these things too much, if we try to control what happens at death, very often we just mess it up. Because we don't really know what we're doing. And if the Buddha says we shouldn't, there's no, doesn't talk about it, really, there is no point in doing that. So I would say, don't do that at your death, but just relax, for goodness sake, yeah? You deserve to relax when you're dying at last. Uh, don't kind of stress around, oh, I've got to think like this, I've got to make this kind of determination or whatever. Uh, and it just makes you confused, it makes life even more difficult. Hard enough to die already, right? Uh, isn't that true? <laughs> so we don't need all of this extra pressure when we're dying. So just chill when you're dying and enjoy. <laughs> so, Exactly, chill out, don't freak out, that's exactly the right, that's exactly the right way of thinking. So then there is this other idea that there is too much sukha in the heavenly realm to really practice. But uh, in truth, uh, does the Buddha say that anywhere? And he doesn't say that anywhere, yeah? This is the interesting thing here. This is again is one of these later traditions, uh, and you find it very common in the Buddhist world, uh, that we try that is dangerous to get reborn in the heavenly realm because there's too much happiness. The human realm is better suited for practice, but the Buddha never actually says these things. Uh, and when you read the sutta, sometimes you hear about people being in the heavenly realm and listening to the word of the Buddha and kind of practicing in the heavenly realm. I don't know if the legs of the devas get into the cross-legged posture. I don't know. I haven't really asked the devas about that. Uh, so not sure if they can sit down in a cross-legged posture, but maybe there's other things they can do. According to the suttas, devas can become stream enters, devas can become enlightened, yeah? These things happen in the heavenly realm, so don't worry too much about this sort of stuff. There's nothing about it in the suttas. Just relax, allow, trust your kamma, take, let the kamma take you wherever you want to go. Just make sure you make the best kind of foundation in this life by living well, by trying your very best to live a, live a life of a good Buddhist, and then you will be as prepared as you can be for a good rebirth when it happens. And hopefully you will then be able to continue practicing in the heavenly realm. Maybe there will still be Buddhism in the heavenly realm, but it may have died out among humans. Yeah, how strong is Buddhism in the human realm? We don't know how long it's going to last, but in the heavenly realm it will last much longer because there are much longer lives. There are so many uncertain factors. Don't try to control all this, uh, because very likely you will mess it up. Uh. <coughs> okay. Next one. Dear Ajahn, when someone in the family is against, or rather does not agree to our view in Buddhist practice, uh, what should I do? Case in point, recently there was a family function, and the whole roast piglet, a whole roast piglet, was ordered despite my objections. It was carried out. How should I respond in future if such a situation occurs? If this is a sm small roast piglet, so they, they, they order a whole roast piglet, and you probably are concerned about a piglet, yeah? Rightly so. It's not ri nice to roast a piglet like that. And, but remember, this is fairly small, yeah? It is not a big issue. It is not worthwhile making a big argument out of it uh, because a lot of people in this world, they do this kind of things. They eat meat, yeah? And they can still be good Buddhists in some other areas. Uh, so don't make too much of a big deal out of these things. Uh, there are, uh, you know, even though my father was kind of a, you know, he was kind of leaning towards Buddhism and, and kind of doing the right things and doing a bit of meditation. I was, it was very hard for me to convince him not to drink alcohol, for example, yeah? So I didn't even try, I didn't bother. When I saw my parents or my siblings doing things that I'd consider inappropriate, I wouldn't tell them off. I wouldn't say bad things to them, because I know that only tends to have 
negative repercussions if you do that. Uh, so you are accepting of the flaws in your family members. Yeah, Don't try too hard to make them perfect. Ordering is a roast piglet is not the biggest biggest of deal. If he had ordered the killing of another person, uh, then you have greater cause for concern. Yeah. So if, if your father or orders someone to be killed, then say, please dad, don't do that. It's a bad idea to kill other people. And your father says, hmm, maybe you have a point. Yeah. Then you are doing your job as your daughter or son or whatever it is. Uh, if it is really bad like that, then you try to stop them. But don't make big deals out of these little things. Or if you, you can say it, but okay, if it doesn't work, okay, just let go very quickly. If you make a big deal out of it, often they become even more resistant. Uh, so this is really the way. Be gentle. Don't be attached to what your family members do. Be independent. Stand apart. Okay, allow it to be. Then you will have a little bit of influence when the time is right to say something. Yeah. You have to know the right time. This is one of those very important tricks. If you want to convince others, the right time to talk is paramount. Don't talk if you get a bit heated. Don't talk if you get upset about something. Don't talk if you feel attachments, because they will feel, they will know that you are coming from a place, not because you want to help them, but basically because of your own attachments. Then they won't be all that impressed. Yeah, But if they feel that you are talking to them because you care about them, then they are much more likely to listen. Okay, Dad, please do whatever you like. If you want to order roast piglet, it's your job. I will love you anyway. That will really go to their heart, yeah? Okay. Okay, comments. Considering rebirth, we may be reborn as animals for food. But since we don't want to be killed and to be eaten, best not to even produce the demand for meat. Uh, yes, I think that is a, is a good point. So don't produce the demand for meat and they will have many good, con uh, good um, results from not eating meat. So that's, uh, that's, that's true. And it's hard to find a being who had not been our mother before, including the animals we eat. Uh, uh, it becomes disgusting to think that the body was the body of a being who used to be our mother. Uh, yeah, so that is a nice way of kind of turning you away and making you more vegetarian. Yeah, to think that these beings, all of them, have kind of maybe been your mother in the past. It's a good point, isn't it? Uh, so why, how can we kind of eat our own mother? I guess that is really, <laughs> that is a kind of very strong image. Veganism has a more urgent call to it due to the global warming and preventing animal-based disease from becoming a pandemic. Yeah. So um, there are indeed many good reasons for being a vegetarian or a vegan these days. And uh, uh, one thing is animal welfare, another one is uh, global uh, warming in general. Uh, and uh, so the many, many good reasons for uh, for kind of living in this way. So I think it's, uh, I think personally think it's a good idea. It's interesting when you go and visit Ajahn Ganha in Thailand, who I talked about before, his monastery is a vegetarian monastery here. Uh, very rare in Thailand, but he is actually a complete vegetarian and has been like that for many, many decades. Uh, that's kind of interesting here. Uh. Okay, we've come to the last question. Uh, so this was a long long one. There won't be any meditation afterwards. Uh, I, I apologize, uh, but things kind of got stretched out a little bit today. It's kind of, how many of you are leaving? Is, is the last day today? Is it many, many of you? Uh, one, okay, two, three, okay, a few of you, okay. Okay. So, uh, okay. Dear Ajahn, is it True that transferring of merit is only effective if one has attained the first jhana. Kindly clarify. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I don't. It doesn't say anything about that in the suttas. Uh, you dedicate your merit to your departed. Yeah, and if there is, if you have some departed person in the petaloka, then they will be able to uh, receive that merit. Uh, but what if you have no family member in the Petaloka? What happens then? There will be one there. Yeah, there will be somebody there. Right? Yeah, you have listened to my teaching in the past. Yeah, we could have been there before. <laughs> we had these things before. 
So, and this is, this is the point, and this is actually again from the suttas. He, the Buddha says that it is impossible that you should not have a relative in the Petaloka because the, uh, time and the samsara has been going on for so long. You are guaranteed to have some relative in Petaloka that can receive the merit. Uh, but they can't receive merit in hell realm. Only Petaloka, according to, to the, this particular sutta. So it will probably be more effective if you attain the first jhana. Your power of your mind will be greater. You will have more ability to send metta, kindness, and all these kind of things. And that, of course, so that helps. But it's not an absolute requirement. The proverb, to be cruel is to be kind. <laughs> Sometimes telling one, uh, someone the brutal truth to someone can be harsh. Is it against? Is it? It is. Is it against the fourth precept? Um, so, yes, it uh, can be brutal to tell the truth to someone. And the point, of course, is not to be brutal. Yeah, we don't really want to be brutal to people. So. You want to be kind. This is the purpose of this. Uh, if you lie to people to deceive them, you're not being kind. But telling the brutal truth is also not to be kind. So you have to tell the truth, but at the right time. Yeah. Sometimes you don't even need to tell the truth. Not always people need to know the truth. Sometimes they, you know, sometimes the truth is kind of irrelevant. Yeah. Maybe there are things that they just don't need to know. But if they really need to know something then you have to know the right time. And then when you know the right time, it won't be so hurtful, and then it will be okay. On the other hand, sometimes people will get hurt, and if they get hurt a little bit, that's okay. The Buddha says in the, one of the suttas, that is, if you have a small child, and the child has a piece of meat stuck in the throat, uh, then you will take your finger into the throat and pull it out, if necessary. Yeah, even if you draw blood, even if you hurt that, hurt that child, you will do that. Uh, why? So the child can live, otherwise it might choke on that piece of meat. Uh, so sometimes hurting someone, not coming from anger, but knowing that it will be in the long-term benefit, is okay. Yeah? Um, sometimes with children, maybe you have to kind of be a bit assertive with them. You don't have to be angry with them, but being a bit assertive is sometimes required, maybe to stop them from doing things where they hurt themselves or whatever it is. Uh, so harsh, try not to be harsh, uh, try to be kind. Uh, remember, telling the truth is, uh, should be done in the right way, uh, not through an act of harshness, uh, but ideally with an act of kindness. Uh, and then you will be on the right track. It's all about being kind, yeah? This is what the Dhamma is all about. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Uh. Anyway, I have no more energy now. I'm completely depleted of energy. I'm talking, talking, talking. <laughs>